Ducky, thank you for joining us on the Claiming Stories podcast presented by Vista. We appreciate you coming out here to Portland, man. How you feeling? Good. Thank you, b man, for having me. Um, just, you know, being back in Portland. And uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to talk about my journey and my process. So I appreciate you guys having me. You've had a couple different journeys and, and careers and experiences. So, uh, you know, I think it's, it's fun to be able to get into that, um, especially because a lot of times, sometimes we grow up thinking that there's only one direction. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times there's a lot of different directions and pockets that we could get into, you know. Yeah. Uh, and then we, we saw you a little bit in D.C., Last year when we came through for, for Raleigh, for Dreamville. Yeah. Um, and story I'm sorry, for, for, for Storytellers, for um, Howard Homecoming. Yes. Uh, which is dope. It was great energy in the city that, that, that weekend. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, tell me what's been going on. How's, how's been the, the, what, 10 years, 11 years back since you've been in Portland? I mean, I, you know, Portland looks different a yeah. little bit. Um, not necessarily for the better. Yeah. But it, also, like, you know, like every other city, it's, it's growing. Yeah. So, you know, I can see like there's more food spots and there's, you know, more shopping and that kind of stuff. But, um, you know, Portland is just rich with tradition. I mean, this is a, it's a beautiful city. I, I like coming here. And, you know, I used to visit here a lot for like Nike and Adidas. I was going to ask you, I was like, what, what are you coming in for account meetings and, and figuring out, looking at lines and yep. all that stuff? Yep. Yeah, pre-lines. And, you know, I mean, the first time I've ever been to Portland was back in like 92, I, I, I want to say. <laughs> so Nike had three buildings. That was it? Yes. <laughs> Three buildings, Three buildings and uh, rest in peace to uh, Sandy Bulldecker. He was our tour guide. Oh wow! Yeah, that must have been a really fun tour guide. It was. Come on. It was. Um, now tell me where. When talk to me a little bit about childhood, right? So, mm -hmm. where'd you grow up? Where were you born? So I was born in South Korea. Okay. So I was born in South Korea and I lived there for the first twelve years of my life. Mm. And uh, my dad worked for the U.S. government. So we had an opportunity to legally immigrate to the United States. He had a uh, job lined up, mm -hmm. um, you know, so we decided to move because my parents thought that it would give me the uh, best opportunity to, you know, get the best education possible and just, you know, grow. So, what, was the, what was that day-to-day -day like uh, in, in Korea before making that move? Because you didn't move till you were 12, and so you're right. like, you got a whole life you know, you got friends, you got routines, all that stuff. What was that like? I mean, I've had they're pretty vivid memories, even though, like, I always kind of consider, like, it, it, the day I came to the United States as, like, my second birthday. Like, I, you know, <laughs> it, it, I was a baby again. I, it transformed. But um, my first 12 years in Korea was good. I mean, you know, a lot of, lot of hiking and like the outdoor life, yeah. you know, just uh, going to like, you know, Oceanside and like eating, you know, their, their fresh caught fish and like seafood, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, did a lot of traveling on weekends. Where would you um, go? Just like in like further out of the city, like jumping on planes or just like trains and kind of... No planes. The, the first plane ride I ever had was coming to, was coming to LA. 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 Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, just uh, getting in trains or cars and, you know, taking long rides. Um, the Korea was back then, like not as industrialized as we know it. Like, you know, it's a world power now. Yeah. But back then it was still struggling to survive and, you know, actually thrive as like a, you know, newly emerging like a technology and like, a, you know, it just uh, culturally, they were, they were just trying to emerge out of, you know, being in a war. Mm -hmm. So um, it was different. And I think, you know, not until like after we left and 1988 Olympics came around and the world got to see the whole country, they didn't come to like the industrial stage. Mm. So it was like, you know, it was the pre good life at, you know, in Korea. So it was like, you know, some of the parts even in Seoul were like very third worldish. Wow. You know, we used to play kickball. You know, we used to uh, take like a, a tea kettle and throw like fake diamonds. And then, like, you know, play, like, a, you know, a, a kickball, you know, and then play, like, stickball and stuff like that. Yeah. Did you did you feel like during that time, did you notice that there was anything different? Or were you just a kid and you were just having fun and you were, you were okay as far as you knew? 
Yeah, no, I was I was okay as far as I knew. I mean, like, you know, back in those days, there were a lot of like bullying and you know things like that, and there were a lot of fights at schools mm-hmm. um, because I didn't grow up in like the necessarily the best neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of like you know fights at schools, and the kids used to wear soccer cleats to school on days that they wanted to stomp on somebody. Whoa! Yeah, that young? Yeah, kids were like fighting with with cleats on and and, and soccer spikes. Yeah. I remember mean, molded soccer spikes, but it still hurts. Yeah, yeah, it still hurts. Did yeah. you ever get, get caught up in some of that stuff? No, I mean, I, I, I was always very resourceful. Mm. So, you know, I would go befriend, like, the older guys mm. or guys that got held back in grades, help them with homework or, you know, help them with, like, you know, just the school in general. Yeah. So, you know, they'll be able to either protect me or, like, you know, they'll do whatever I need them to, do, you know, take yeah, care for yeah. me. So, you know, like, I'm going to figure out how I can navigate this. Yeah. Did you have any siblings? My brother is 12 years older than me, okay, so, so he, he was, was already, completely... yeah, he was in college and he, uh, part of the time that, uh, like, when I was about to leave, he was in the uh, army because, you know, you had to go to mandatory service. Mm-hmm. And that's another thing that my parents try to avoid for me is, like, having to go serve in the army. Yeah, So yeah, they wanted something different for yeah. you. And yeah. so around 12, y'all moved to where, California? We moved to California, so uh, we landed in... LA mm-hmm. and that was just a whole culture shock because like it was middle of December and it was like 90 degrees. I mean I would have loved that. <laughs> you know, so uh, imagine you know me as a little kid like coming off with like parka and like a blanket and it's hot and yeah. I don't want to walk I don't want to like you know do anything like you know I just want to see the sun outside you know and we also had to wait for a long time before like our final plane, which would take us to where we settled, which was Monterey, California. It's in the mm-hmm. Central Coast. Um, beautiful town, mm-hmm. but as a young person, like when I moved there, I found it to be really horribly boring. Cause like, you know, it, it, when I was a little kid in Korea, like, you know, as nine or 10 years old, mm-hmm. We used to go around to go to theaters and stuff without parent supervision. Like we would get on, you know, trains and buses. Wait, I mean, you were getting on trains without your parents? <laughs> different times, man. Different like, I mean, times. I think if you talk to like anyone who grew up in like New York City, yeah. that's you know in their like early 50s or like late 40s right now, they'll tell you the same thing. Like they used to get around with no concept of like you know the dangers that were around the present right because yeah. there were there were still you know stuff going around uh then same stuff that's happening now but yeah. it just doesn't feel like maybe it was that present or folks didn't talk about it as much but it's funny you, you remind me of like my childhood too but i wasn't i wasn't going on trains ducky but i was right. like on a bike in the neighborhood right. <laughs> you know i think the the, the boldest i got was like um was going, taking my bike into another neighborhood. Right. right. <laughs> but, you know, you actually got to travel, though. I mean, like, you got to travel around the city. Like, it's still a small area to cover, but, like, you know, you got on, like, the city buses and you got on, like, the, you know, the, the city metro or, you know, subway or whatever, and you got, uh, you were able to go from, you know, place to place. I mean, like, when I was a little kid, after school, we used to go to a TV station. In the hopes of getting picked for a, a quiz show, <laughs> so like I had this like a little rap pack of friends that you know I was like the ringleader. Mm-hmm. Would take like bus two stops over, and just w- sit there and hope to meet like celebrities, yeah. get autographs, or like you know hopefully like the security guard takes pity on us and let us like go into auditions or like you know go to the taping. Yeah, and they finally did. Whoa. Yeah, I won like an encyclopedia set as a fifth grader. <laughs> What did that experience do for you? Like, you're fifth grade, you're able to kind of be on TV, be in the media, be a part of this thing. What did that, did that unlock anything for you? I mean, I think looking back, I think it just gave me the idea that if I hustle hard enough, Mm. I can get discovered doing stuff, you know, Mm. whatever it is. Yeah. But, you know, again, like just being resourceful. Like, I think that's like the key takeaway for anything that I've ever done as a child or as an adolescent was just, you know, being resourceful and try to figure out a way to talk to people and talk my way into things. Mm, I like that. Tell me about life in Monterey. So out, outside of like weather being different in California, mm-hmm. um, Monterey probably was a little cooler in yeah. temperature, right? Yeah. 
and then um, not having much to do. Um, how did you feel as far as like you as a, as a person and you as your family? Was there a community of folks there that at least maybe you, you, you saw yourself a bit in that community? What was, what was that like? Well, I mean, I didn't feel like I was in the community that my parents belonged to because they came here as immigrants and they immediately gravitated towards like the Korean church. Hmm. And, you know, they were basically very stuck in their old ways. Like, you know, the, the funny thing about immigrant community is that like whenever that sort of the transition point, as I call it, happens, that's the time warp that you're stuck in. You know, so if a person came over in 1972, you're thinking of your old country in 1972, but America also doesn't change, you know, moving forward from 1972, like you're stuck. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's the trauma of like, you know, getting accustomed to new culture or, you know, whatever it is. But like, you know, it just seems like people have this time warp where like, you know, they stop, everything stops. It's a frozen moment mm -hmm. for them. So. I, you know, I knew right away, like when I started, you know, uh, interacting with some of those folks that they're not accepted by like the mainstream American culture. Um, if anything, they weren't even like really kind of willing to learn hmm. about, you know, the pop culture or anything like moving forward. And this is the early 80s. So it was exciting times, like, you know. There's a lot happening, there's a lot changing in the middle yes. of the 80s. Yes, I mean, music videos yeah. just came out. <laughs> you know, MTV, like, I, I, was, I was around when MTV had that, you know, the astronaut and the flag. <laughs> yeah, so like, you know, all of that stuff mm -hmm. just, you know, happened right before my eyes. Wow. And, um, you know, I didn't speak a single word of English, like, you know, I had to learn. Like, you know, my, fortunately my father was a translator, so, oh. you know, I had some help, mm -hmm. but he didn't teach me any English before we before moved. Before you moved, so you were really having to learn yeah. and make a lot of mistakes and not be a part of a lot of conversations. And How I, did that make you feel? Well, I think not speaking the language is not as even traumatic as like not being able to fit in and understand the culture. Like, you know, being, being part of like the teenage culture or pop culture. So early on, like I, I knew that like I was dressed different. Mm -hmm. My haircut didn't fit in with everybody else. Like, you know, I had a ball cut. Mm -hmm. I had like a really tremendous ball cut, like, you know, looking like Andy Warhol. <laughs> um, you know, the, the ball cut and a turtleneck, you know, like, and that's just not, not normal, yeah. right? And, I, I found that like my classmates make fun of me or like they'll take advantage of the fact that I don't understand English. So like, you know, they'll ask questions in a way where like, you know, they just basically can meme myself, you know, meme me yeah. in, in make, ways. Make, make fun of you. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's just they are kind of like the whole like the wordplay, like when did you stop beating your spouse? Mm. You know, mm. if you say yes. I mean, if you say like, you know, the time, then you used to beat your spouse, you know, mm. but like, you know, there, when you say no, like they're, they're, you're still beating hmm. your spouse, right? Like, so so they like trick you into agreeing to these really, you know, bad things yeah. and you're like, that's not, that's not what I meant. And I even know what y'all were saying. Not at all, huh. you know, and then, um, you know, I was in ESL class. So that means that, ESL? English as a second language. Ah. So I was in like a trailer, you know, uh, in my middle school that was like yeah, because they would have these these separate uh, centers for different classes. And yes. Stuff. Yeah. So I mean, I I experienced that. Um, I was good at math because you know the, the Korea was so far ahead of math and, and math compared to America. So like when I came here, like I was able, allowed to skip a grade and <laughs> you know do well in math, but everything else was just a disaster. Mm. And um, you know, growing up, like I didn't get good counseling, guidance counseling from schools, you know, so like, you know, they didn't tell me about TOEFL, they didn't tell me about like, you know, testing as an English as a foreign language. Mm -hmm. So that also like kind of deterred me from applying to like the top flight schools, even though I had good grades in yeah, yeah. math, but like my verbal school was horrible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that went on for a while. I mean, I played sports as a way of like fitting in. Hmm. So you found, well, that, that would make sense, right? Because if the, the language is a barrier, 
But if you could just be really good at this thing, then you could essentially play with anyone, right? I mean, I wasn't any good, but <laughs> I, I tried really hard. Yeah. And I mean, like, you know, I was there, like I did, you know, my, my whole thing was about dedication and just being there, like, you know, and sticking out until the end, like, you know, making sure, like, I don't pass out from, like, exhaustion or, like, you know, if the coaches turn on the fire hose because, you know, I'm running the last leg, then, you know, I just got to avoid it. Like, you know, just got to run the laps a little bit faster. Wow. You know, but I mean, like, you know, this is the 80s, right? Like, the abuses like that were considered normal. Yeah, I mean, like, just the reference of, like, the, the fire hose is like, could you imagine that happening today? No you'd be way. fired. You'd, you'd be fired. You'd be all over <laughs> you'd get the media. Sued. You'd be sued. Your life would be, be ruined. Um, so, so talk to me as you're, as you're finding your space and trying to figure out things that you can resonate with mm -hmm. and you can enjoy this culture. Um, Hip-hop starts to become a part of your world, yes. right? Yes. Um, how does it get introduced to you? So there was a um, uh, there was a student that was a year older than me, and he was like a big man on campus at the time. Like you know, he was taller and stronger than everybody, and you know, he played. He was like a forward on the school middle school basketball team, and uh, Mike was like the first person who showed me. He was like one of the few people that showed me a lot of just, you know, friend, friendliness from the get. And instead of like trying to take advantage of like, you know, the fact that I didn't speak English or I lacked understanding, he was trying to, you know, include me in a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he'll tell other kids like, hey, stop messing with him, man. Like he's just trying to learn and fit in, like, you know, leave the kid alone. Yeah. And I noticed that he, everything that he did, like, you know, all the girls, all the guys, like everybody was jocking him. Hmm. But one field where like he kind of stood out and everybody kind of like sort of were annoyed by him was his choice of music. Huh. And he listened to hip hop. Huh. You know? And the first record that I ever heard him play on his boot box was Apache hmm. by Sugar Hill Gang. Yeah. And I was fascinated because I've never heard music like this before. And I've heard R&B, but R&B was like old people music, <laughs> you know? And it wasn't that different from rock and roll. Like, you know, same thing. Like, you know, it's just older. But the rock music, I felt like it, was, it really spoke specifically to all those white kids that were like making fun of me. Mm -hmm. um, this rap music was interesting. Mm -hmm. It was disruptive. Yeah. And one thing that I noticed, a lot of those kids that also made fun of me hated it. And mm -hmm. they were like, you know, turn that shit off. Why do you, why do you think they, they hated it? Because it's something that they don't understand. It doesn't, mm -hmm. it doesn't come from them. It comes, it's an alternative. It comes from a different culture. Yeah. And it's, at the time, it's also the culture that they were trying to oppress. Right. Because 80s, late 70s, early 80s, I mean, we haven't really gotten away too far from those days, right? Like, I mean, we live in a much more integrated society and much better understanding of like each other's culture, but things were very segregated back then, right? Mm -hmm. So playing black music was sort of being frowned upon, especially in a predominantly like white area. Yeah. And also like, you know, in the context of like, you know, competition, this is like a mostly white team getting killed by some of these, you know, black dominated basketball teams, right? Right. And these, these are the kids that are coming out with that same music mm -hmm. and your best player, who's a white guy, hmm. is listening to that same music. Right. So it rubbed them the wrong way. Hmm. And, you know, I hear like parents saying like, turn the jungle music off. Wow. You know, it was blatant. Wow. Right, but like that, uh, that kind of like you know, as a young mind who you know, who like thought of himself as an outsider, th that like made the light bulb in my head go off. Like, hmm. I like this. This is like something different. Like this, yeah, I identify with this way more than anything else. A jukebox hero, <laughs> yeah. or you know, things like that. You know, you know, you know Jesse's girl. Hmm. You know, like I, th those things were popular. Yeah. But like, I didn't really. It just didn't gravitate towards no. it. It's same same with me, you know. It's just the it's the differences of it. I just never 
because it never was. It never was for me. It wasn't meant for me to 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 resonate with it. I would never have those experiences as I as I grew up. Um, right. And it's 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 interesting at times when you are in communities and environments where predominantly large white environments, mm -hmm. and those are their reference points. And it's 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 always hilarious to me when when folks assume that those are also our reference points. And I'm like, I have no idea what that song is. Never heard it in my life. Never will. <laughs> yeah. um, how did that that community start to, and just the music, how did that start to influence you? Well, I, I mean, I felt like, honestly, like I felt like I was a little bit special because I listened to this, mm -hmm. right? Like, because breakdancing was becoming popular. Yeah. Did you dance? A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, you know, we, we used to bring cardboards to school and, you know, get yelled at by, like, the, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the security guards and whatnot. Um, I tried to bring a boom box. Like, I saved up money and bought a boom box, and I brought it to school. Like, first, you know, first day I brought it, yeah. you know, my assistant principal called my father and said, like, you know, he can't have this, oh, you know. But, like, it was, it was interesting. And, like, you know, we had, like, a sprinkle of color in my high school too. Like, you know, there were a couple, you know, black kids mm -hmm. and there were, you know, a couple of like Mexican kids that yeah. were into dancing. And like, you know, we formed like a little, you know, cypher yeah. and, you know, did what we could. Um, but, you know, that was like, I, I try to learn as much as I can. And, you know, like the thing was, you know, the, in those days, rap records came out like maybe once every other month. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Cause there's a new, there's like, I don't know, a hundred or so, uh, thousand songs every thousand, day now. Thousand songs get uploaded to SoundCloud every, <laughs> every second, right? <laughs> so back then, like, you know, you didn't really have to look that far. Like, you know, I remember when you know, World Famous Supreme Team and, you know, Malcolm McLaren, Buffalo Girls, like, they had a cool video. Mm. So I went and got it. Like, you know, I, I saved up money, got the record. I didn't want to get busted, my parents. So I they, they slid it under my, like, door. You know, uh, got it like, you know, you know like later on when everybody went to sleep. Yeah. So that kind of stuff. I mean, like, you know, discovered uh, Def Jam, mm -hmm. you know, things like that. Just, you know, you bought records based on a label. Hmm. So if the label, like, for example, Def Jam. So how, yeah. take me through that process. What do you mean if you, if you bought it because of a label? So it, back then, like when Run DMC came out, right? Like mm -hmm. Russell Simmons was managing mm -hmm. them. So by association, Def Jam, when he started Def Jam, was a legit, you know, resource. Mm. So that meant you, so what you're saying is anything Def Jam, you felt like you had to- It's vouch for. It's, yeah, so yeah. you were like, oh, it's, it's gonna be great. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's automatic, Yeah. you know? So when LL Cool J came out, mm. You know, yeah, I, I mean, he was kind of strange with like, you know, big white go-go boots and all that, but like, he was on Def Jam, so he must be good, you he know. Must be good. And then like, he, you know, he's, he's got Adidas on and mm -hmm. Run DMC got Adidas on. Like, I need to go buy me some Adidas, hmm. you know. It was like that. It was like that. You know. What did your parents think? Thought I was strange. Hmm. And, you know, I, yeah, I started hanging out a little bit more with, like, you know, friends of color outside of my school, which, you know, they thought was also strange because, like, how, do I, how am I meeting these guys? And, you know, it's all, like, connected with music and sports. But, you know, it's kind of strange because, like, you know, they knew, like, my classmates because, you know, you will see them at school functions and banquets and all of that. And then, like, I have a whole other set of friends that I met through, you know, my boy Mike. Hmm. And Mike was going to a private school at the time. Mm -hmm. So, like, I'm at, I'm at a public school in town. He's at a private school. And we all kind of, like, gather at his private school. And he had a radio show. And it was like a, he had a radio, he had a, he had a radio show. Right. And because they, they had a transmitter. So, like, you know, we would gather up. And that's where, like, I met a lot of my friends. Huh. He had a radio show. This is crazy to me. Like, I'm tripping. Did yeah. you ever jump on? Did you ever participate in the programming? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, it, it, I would, like, you know, get on and play the records if he goes to the bathroom, <laughs> you know, make announcements, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. Any opportunity. Yeah. But um, it was, you know, it, it was, like, just emulating. Mm. whoever like we heard so like I grew up in that you know central coast and it close to Bay Area mm -hmm. so like you know there was a station called KSOL okay. KSOL 
and there was, you know, all these individuals that were great, you know, air, air personalities, and we try to, you know, emulate those guys. Yeah, that's, I mean, those are the reference points, so you're trying to, you know, you think what they're doing is what you should be doing until right. you start to figure out, like, what you want your own your own vibe to be right yeah but also like you know that you know starting in hip-hop it grew my appreciation for like other forms of r&b and mm. jazz and like you know there was at that time there was a lot of fusion jazz mm. so herbie hancock you yeah. know the team up with grand mix of dst like yep. you know that was a big break dancing record so i got into that and like you know so on and so forth so just started collecting records and you know, I thought I was a DJ, so like I, you know, went out and got some Mickey Mouse turntables first, <laughs> and like you know, that didn't end up really well. So like I started saving money to what get the, the techniques. What, what happened? You just weren't, were you not getting gigs, or you felt like you just didn't, couldn't get the technique and stuff down, or? No, the equipment wasn't right. Oh, you know, because like techniques, twelve hundred is expensive. Oh yeah. <laughs> so I, you know, I had like a home style, like Fisher turntables. <laughs> You know, and those are good for like just playing the music on your stereo system. Because you remember, you remember like, you know, as a kid, like you remember those big rack stereo right. systems, right? Right, right. So you take away like components and you try to put together like a makeshift, uh, you know, DJ setup. But like then, you know, you look at TV and these guys all have the strobes on the 1200s and they have the mixers and, you know, the Gemini mixers were big. Huh. And... I wanted one of those, but like you had to travel to like San Francisco to buy them. Like wow. you couldn't buy them in local stores. You know, we didn't have Amazon back then. Yeah, we didn't have Amazon back then. What, um, I mean, you, as a kid, you were jumping on trains to get to all these places. What was stopping you going to San Francisco? <laughs> Too far, and Too far. you know, my dad thought that was like a, you know, long trip. Like, you know, Asian drivers, you know, anything over like hour and a half, two hours is a long trip. Like you gotta pack lunches and like, you know, have like drinks in a cooler type thing. Yeah. So, yeah. so that was off the table. That it was off the table. And then like, I think, uh, I, I recall like the first time we ever went to San Francisco, I think we got a parking ticket. <laughs> you know, San Francisco will do that. Like, yeah. They like they heavily ticket out there. It's heavily ticket. Crazy. And also they'll have like, you know, no parking, no standing zones everywhere. Yeah. And so you're just driving around forever <laughs> trying to figure out and you, where you want to go is of course right there. Yeah. Um well, so I think there's a fine line between being you know, the understanding the client's economic situation or background, right? Mm. Versus like becoming a becoming subject to exploitation. Mm. So, if I have to work free for like a Fortune 500 company <laughs> or a multinational conglomerate, right, and I don't get paid, there's something wrong with that picture. Mm -hmm. You know, like maybe I'm getting pimped. Mm -hmm. You know, but. The source was like started by two kids out of a dorm room at Harvard University. <laughs> so, uh, you know, just a common sense would dictate that they didn't have a lot of they money. Have a lot of cash on hand to start that business. You know, their parents may have had cash to send them to you know Harvard, but they themselves were struggling college students. Mm. So, I mean, when I went to their office in New York, it was everybody was my age or younger. <laughs> you know, I met I met my man Matty C. You know, he was like doing unsigned hype. Hmm. Um, he was there. Yeah. You know, Reginald C. Dennis. You know, James Bernard. Like all these guys, man. Like you know, and I I feel like they were sort of my heroes, even though like we're close in age, because hmm. they had like that first person view of the artists that I really looked up to. Hmm you know, that I enjoyed like listening to their art. And these guys were not only journalists, cause I mean like, you know, you have guys like Greg Tate, mm -hmm. who's like a journalist, yeah. but these guys were part of the culture. Hmm. And it's, it's like, you know, you're, I think in nineties when Source and those guys, you know, came along, for the first time, like they blur the line between a fair, a person who's part of the culture yeah. versus like a objective like writer. Right. And I'm not saying like, you know, we don't need objective writers because like I think that's that's refreshing to have somebody from outside the window yeah, looking in. Just being able to observe, right? Mm -hmm. But it's also a different lens to be immersed 
in, in the culture. And you're being more of a documenter. Right. right. And also, like, they, they're they able to amplify the bo voice mm -hmm. of our own community because mm -hmm. they come from it. Mm -hmm. You know, they experience the same things that we experience every day. Like, you know, I go up to the source offices and, like, you know, we're always going to listening parties. Mm -hmm. We're always hanging out at the rooftop at some club meeting with artists, mm -hmm. you know. And there's, you know, L's being passed around and 40s being passed around all the time. <laughs> So, I mean, that was like, you know, if you ask me, would I ever do that again for free? The answer is 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it was fun. Like, you know, it's, it's almost like you're on a vacation, <laughs> you know, yeah. but you're working and oh. you're networking. Huh. And it's, it's like Club Med for hip hop heads. Right? <laughs> so, yeah, I don't, I, you know, I, I don't regret that at all. Yeah. And I mean, there's, there's been parts of my career where like I felt like I did get taken advantage of. Like, you know, when I uh, interned for Hoop It Up, hmm. which is part of the NBA, mm -hmm. I made cold calls to, you know, secure a bunch of sponsorships. Mm -hmm. You didn't see any of that? That's definitely being taken advantage That's of. That's being taken advantage of. Yeah. For sure. But again, in that instance, right, there's probably like, thousands of kids that want to somehow land their feet in the NBA mm -hmm. doing something. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're not good enough to play ball, if you're not a coach, like how do you get close to that matrix? Right. And you got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And maybe the way to do that is by volunteering and being useful. Mm -hmm. You know, so even in that situation, like I met a lot of people, a lot of great people. And it was like, you know, three months of my life where like I wore a suit and tie every day to go into office. <laughs> I don't regret it. Yeah. You know, because that gave me another perspective. Hmm. You know, and when you're that young, you have nothing to lose but to just learn. And like right. some kids nowadays, like, you know, you take a gap year mm -hmm. or you take like a year to like explore you know, go on a uh, hiking trip or go on a backpack trip to Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're still wasting money. <laughs> Either way, you're, you, still, you're still paying. You're still paying uh, you know, for something. you're still paying for something. So, you know, to work and gain work experience for free, I, I don't necessarily think it's that bad. Yeah. You know, I mean, we we used to travel to like music conferences, right? And I didn't really have like a sponsor or like a job mm. to go to music uh, conferences other than to network and like hopefully find a gig or find like a contract a to work on yeah. and to gain relationships. I mean, when I was like 23, 24, I used to sleep on people's floors. Mm. You know, if one of my friends had a corporate record gig and like it had a hotel room and had like extra room, yeah, we'll get a cot. Yep. I'll, yeah. I'll give them $25 to get that extra <laughs> cot. I sleep on that cot. Yeah. You know, and I mean, there's been times when, like, you know, we rented a vehicle and slept in a vehicle. Like, yeah. you know. Did what you had to do to get where you wanted to go. Even if you necessarily know where you were going, you were, you were very trusting that as long as it was, as, as, it was, as, long as it was in this space, yeah, and, and as, 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 as long, yeah, as long as it was safe yeah. and I, I wasn't taking advantage of somebody yeah. and I didn't humiliate myself, mm -hmm. I was fine. You're like, I'm fine. Yeah, you know, like, and I mean, you know, your, uh, your podcast is claiming stories, right? Like you, you're trying to claim a seat, mm -hmm. you know, you're uh, trying to get your seat on the table, mm -hmm. right? Well, to get that seat on the table, you got to work for it. Mm. You don't claim it just by like saying I'm entitled to it. Mm. Nobody's entitled to shit. Mm. You know, like you gotta earn it. You gotta earn it. And 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 I think sometimes folks just get a little too caught up in like the the table aspect of it. And the thing I always say is like it doesn't matter if it's the table you built or if it's the table that somebody else built. Yep. Either one takes work, right? Like. It, it, you're just not gonna magically appear at any one of them. Like they all take effort and work and, and time 
essentially that you have to put in. <laughs> and nobody's going to like buy you resources to build a table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you better come out of pocket and you go to Home Depot, pocket. right? You got to put some skin in the game. Exactly. Um, now tell me a part of this process and a part of this, like you're, you're going on this journey, you end up meeting like different folks that have become like these powerhouses in vast industry, yes. but all connected to hip hop. So yeah. one of those being Diddy, which at the time we knew was Puff. Yeah. Um, how has that, how did that relationship um, take you to the next point in your career? Yeah, I, you know, I think Puff was down here um, after the whole City College incident. And, you know, I read about it in like the New York Post or Daily News. You know, so, so he unfortunately had like some issues with like the security at, at the event and some people got hurt. Mm. So he's down here mm. and he's friends with a lot of the kids that I'm friends with at Howard. Mm. And he's just like, you know, hanging out in one of the Howard dorms and like living there at the time, right? So I approach him and I'm like, you know, can, there, can we do something? Mm. And, you know, wh what do you do? I promote. You know, so he's like, okay, I mean, you know, you can probably help me out with delivering records to some people, you know, I'll introduce you to such and such, you know. Hmm. So I, I go to New York, go to Uptown, and, you know, he introduces me to, like, other cats that do promotion, and I get their records, hmm. you know. And then, like, I use the same, like, I get reference from those guys, and I meet some more people at other brands, and I'm getting records. And then um, there's a gentleman named uh, Sir Charles Dixon. Mm -hmm. He's a, he's a you know, world-renowned DJ, and he's from DC, but he was at WBLS in New York at the time. And Charles was like, hey man, you can actually make your money delivering these records. <laughs> you're, you're like, huh? <laughs> you know, and he worked at Tommy Boy at the time. Mm. And he was like, you know, how would you like to be like our rep or, you know, we'll, we'll put something together. We just, you know, it's not going to be a lot of money, but we'll put something together where like, you know, you can help us track down DJs and, you know, put records in their hands. And I'm like, sure, hmm. let's do it. Hmm. And then, you know, it helped that I knew everyone that was like somebody. Yeah, you already... That's the benefit of you genuinely being interested in a part of, a part of the culture. You already right. knew the people that yep. would need what you were trying to get to them. Yeah, and also, like, you know, there's such a three degrees of separation, right? Like, one of the reasons why I wanted to meet Puff was because, you know, Puff was actually related to Hef. Hmm. Puff was actually related to Pete Rock. Like, you know, they're neighbors and they're, you know, <laughs> cousins by marriage. Like, you know, there's, like, Mount Vernon is a small community yeah. when you really think about it. And, you know, uh, you learn about that through the source. Mm. You learn about that through like uh, friends of you know mine that talk about them because like you know everybody's close. It's it's still a small circle. Yeah. And um, you know it's it, 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 like when you know one person, you you're, you're yeah. pretty much made for everybody else because like you know you're such and such as boy. Right. And you and and that's what, how that reputation carries, right? So whether yeah. it's whether your rep's good, it carries. Whether your rep's bad, it carries as well. That's what exactly. happens in these small circles. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, you're carrying records for Tommy Boy. I'm carrying records for, like, you know, different brands, different labels. And then I get an official business card <laughs> from Chemistry Records, PWL Chemistry. And they had, they, they, they had Diamond the Diamond D and the Erotic Exotics. Yeah. Right? Sally got a one-track mind, that record. Yeah. They gave me that record to promote huh. and said, like, you know, get it on mix shows, get it on college radio, like, yeah. help, help us out. And, you know, they gave, gave me, like, 60 copies of the record. And I'm just like, yes. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> I can give it to everybody. You right. Know, like, I, you know, I'll be, like, the most popular, you know, guy. <laughs> right? So, like, I'm going around, like, giving these records out. And then, you know, the next request comes in. It's like, hey, Diamond's going to be down in your way. Like, he, he needs to go to radio station. Like, can you accompany him to radio station? Mm -hmm. So I'm starting to do that, yeah. you know. And then I get a call from Delicious Vinyl, which is in the West Coast, huh. and say, like, you know, so-and-so from PWR Chemistry told us about you, and we want to acquire your services. Huh. So you know, now I got a project, for, you know, working with Orlando at, 
delicious vinyl yeah. doing Far Side. <laughs> and Far Side has this manager named DJ P, Paul Stewart. Mm -hmm. And DJ P, like me, is like sort of an anomaly in the business because he's a white guy mm. who's a DJ in predominantly black world. Right. And P was like, B, you kind of remind me of how I came up. <laughs> Can, can you work with my guys? Huh. So I'm taking Farsight to radio stations, you know, booking them on, you know, these gigs. Mm -hmm. And like, uh, you talk about me working for free, right? Yeah. A lot of those guys, when they're coming up, like, you know, radio stations would have concert, like, you know, you know fall jam, summer jam, you know, winter fest, whatever. But they're not paying. They're not getting paid. Yeah, they're just it's like, a promotional they're trading appearance. for a promotion. You know. Huh. So it, I had them out here. I probably flew them out here like three times to perform. Yeah. And they became huge. Hmm. You know, and the, your mama record was kind of big. And then Passing Me By was huge. And DC was the first market to break that on commercial radio. Wow. So n now my reputation is getting bigger. Yeah, because they're like, oh, he's out here actually getting placed and his artists are, like, the artists he's working with, they're like. Not just college radio, mm -hmm. but commercial stations. Yeah. So, you know, Interscope, which is, a, you know, at the time, fledgling label, right? Like, the brand new label. Yeah. Tom Whaley's their uh, A&R person. They called me, and, you know, there's this guy, uh, Faye Duvernay, mm -hmm. who uh, went on to, like, you know, work for Death Row and everything. Faye calls me up and says, like, yo, I'll, I want you to work my records, because I know you, you know, work with Steve Rifkin and all these guys. Like, you know, I want you to work my records. <laughs> so I get this artist named Tupac. <laughs> What? You know, and I had met him as a roadie. He yeah. was a roadie with Digital Underground before, so like I knew him already. You knew him, yeah, but he, yeah, it was different. You were like, oh, wait, yeah. Yeah, I can do What's that. Up? I can do that. Didn't he just do a movie? And they're like, <laughs> yeah, he, he was in this thing called Juice. Yeah. Let's go. Huh. So I had him, you know, do like a autograph signing session. You know, I leveraged his, you know, movie appearance. Movie, yep. You know, and uh, he had Brenda Got a Baby and all those records, like Keep Your Head Up, like those are coming out. And uh, he did an appearance with BET. You know, so I'm getting to know like the folks at BET now. Yeah. You know, I'm going over there, like I'm participating in their like diversity campaign because they needed an Asian guy, you know, like a Latino guy to like, you know, be in the mix. So like I'm, you know, I'm on screen, yeah. getting to do all this stuff, like, you know, which like, I think like every kid dreams of doing, yeah. but like it just naturally, like kind of, it kind of came yeah. my way because right. I was in with the right folks and I'm, I'm just doing like, you know, whatever they need me to do. You're doing it. I'm doing it. I, I want to ask you, as you think about the future of where hip hop is going, as you've been so largely part of where mm -hmm. it's been, mm -hmm. um, what's your point of view on that? It's good that, you know, folks that look like you and I have been able to build such a large economic mm -hmm. entity mm -hmm. and it's a movement that not, 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 not only like defines American culture but like it's such a large economic force behind it because yeah. like you know when you really think about it as much as like you know some of the guys want to deny it right mm -hmm. like sneaker culture is part of hip-hop absolutely you don't have sneaker culture without hip hop. It would have been just sporting goods. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> so it, things like that, when you really think about like just do it yourself swag mm -hmm. being a byproduct of hip hop, right? It's really just amazing yeah. that we came this far. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you see the culture getting diluted. Yeah. You know, same way, like, you know, jazz, same way as rock and roll, whatever, you know, uh, movements that came before us, mm -hmm. it gets diluted, it gets commercialized, mm -hmm. it gets exploited. Yeah. And it even gets exploited by some people who started out with good intentions mm -hmm. that feel like they owe something, mm -hmm. so they have to go exploit it somehow. Mm -hmm. So you, know, you have that. But you also have like new people coming in just with the whole commercial exploitation in their minds and they're not really thinking about, you know, advancing any thoughts forward. Hmm. And like, you know, the way I see it, I kind of wish we would 
have like, you know, different segments. What do you mean? Like, you know, we had conscious rappers <laughs> in early 90s, yeah. right? Conscious rappers, the Native Tongues movement, mm -hmm. like some of that, we, I want to see the revival. Because hmm. like, there's no love. You know, like hip hop right now is just about access, like, you know, excess, mm -hmm. not access, but access, access. access. Like, you know, it just, it has to be like really over the top. Yeah. And it's more like entertainment than access. It's WWE, man. Yeah. You know, yeah. so like, I want to see love. I want to see like what gravitated me towards it, which was like, you know, feeling of the kinship, right? Mm -hmm. It's not really quite there right now, mm -hmm. you know? So like, I wanna see the love. I wanna see like, you know, kids who otherwise don't have chance to make it, make it because of hip hop. And we do see that, mm -hmm. but like, I don't think we see it as much. Like we don't see the Wu-Tang Clans anymore. Like we don't see movements like that. Mm -hmm. Cause like, I mean, when you look at Wu-Tang and like, you know, now it's just a largely publicized so that everybody knows the story. Right, 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 right. But like, you know, who would imagine like, you know, you know eight, nine different individuals, yeah. you know, all coming out of Staten Island mm -hmm. or like, you know, remote parts of like Brooklyn yeah. and being that successful and that impactful worldwide. Yeah, you can't imagine it at that point in time. It usually it's only over time that we realize the impact yeah. that these, these, these things are happening. I mean, there's colorways. Like, black and yellow is not an <laughs> Iowa Hawkeye's colorway. Sorry. Yeah, you can't, you can't, no one can claim that. Unless That's the Wu-Tang no, color. Unless it's, you know, a sport, like, but even the sport <laughs> is second to Wu-Tang. I, I think <laughs> Wu-Tang may take precedence over Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> Yo, it's, it's true. It's got such a strong hold on on those aesthetics but right you couldn't have predicted that no know, back then even like black and silver right like yeah. the Raiders colors yeah NWA made it relevant right right that's the reason people who didn't even know who the Raiders were <laughs> were wearing Raiders gear yeah <laughs> didn't watch a Raiders game a day in their life yeah but those you know that's what hip-hop does um now take me into 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 major okay. right Take me into major. Um, you know, you got the you got the the brand on right now. Um, what inspired the name, and and what prompted you to even get involved in this line of business? Okay, so I, you know, I was always like it, it, a part of being in this culture is like needing to be noticed, right? And like the absolute requirement of being fresh at all times. <laughs> Like, you can't look like, you know. You can't go anywhere, bummy. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it's not folk music, you know, like, I, you know, no offense to, you know, people in that culture, it's right? Just, like, that's just it's, it's just very are. different. Like, you know, and even when I worked in the music business, like, you know, there were, uh, there were like sort of hippie rappers. Mm. There were like kind of folksy rappers. I mean, I worked with Arrested Development. Yeah. You know, and he was, you know, speech was very unique, mm -hmm. but that wasn't the norm. Like the norm was like just fresh, <laughs> you know, like whether you had like the army fatigues, mm -hmm. you know, champion sweats, yep. you know, the extra, extra big pointy hoods, yep. you know, it, all that was a requirement. Mm -hmm. And um, I grew up a big baseball fan, like I'm a Yankees yeah. fan. Uh, you know, and I was kind of force fed that in Korea because like in Korea, when you turned on the Armed Forces Korea Network, which was like the only English language network when I was growing up, yeah. you only saw Yankees, Dodgers, mm. and the Cowboys mm. and Steelers. Mm. So you had like a choices to make, yeah. you know, so I became a Yankees fan mm -hmm. and I was like a quasi Dallas fan until like I came to the United States and how much hate they got. Yeah. So I became a Raiders fan. <laughs> before all this, you know, the NWA stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, that's really like how I became so interested in being fresh. Yeah. And my parents, you know, just like any other like immigrant household or like minority households in general, right? You have to wear down your shoes. Like oh, if you yeah. didn't see like the rubber plugs coming yeah, out like the you're heel. You're not getting anything new. You're not getting anything new. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, and you better wear the basketball shoes for the courts. Yeah. You're not wearing that don't to wear school. Those. Yeah, no, don't wear those to school. <laughs> you know? And then, like, I, you know, I also grew up in an era where, like, we used Sharpies hmm. to color in, like, school colors <laughs> into, like, white suede. Yeah. You know, so like, you know, whether you had Adidas Top 10 or like the, you know, Nike Air Force Ones or Legends, you colored everything in. <laughs> so um, that was, that was a big thing. Like, you know, wow. and I, you know, I used to doodle yeah. on the back of notebooks, you know, sitting in class, being bored. Yep. So. You are like, some of this stuff had to, had to come out. Yep. So, so tell me a little bit about major, like from a from a fashion standpoint, like what excited, what excites you, I guess, from a fashion standpoint, and how did you start to bring that into creating major? Okay. So um, with sneakers, like when I travel for the music you know, business, right? Like we used to go to Atlanta for like Jack the Rapper mm -hmm. conference and like, you know, go to Impact, go to, you know, these like, you know, conferences, then that's where like a lot of networking happened. And also like we congregated with other friends. Mm. And, you know, that was like a fashion show. <laughs> like, you go to Miami for How Can I Be Down, yeah. everybody had to be fresh. Mm. You know, so like, uh, you know, in the mid-90s, like, you know, I was pulling out like the Aramore Tempos, you know, foam <laughs> posits, yeah. um, Air Max 95s, things like that. So you always had to be like one step ahead of everybody, you know, like just try to have like unreleased sneakers maybe. You know, or like, you know, something that just came out and it was hard to get or it was too expensive to yeah. get. Because that was a part of the culture was like, if you had like a pair of kicks that nobody had, like, everybody was like, yo, Ducky, what are those? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and Bobito Garcia, mm -hmm. you know, the, who authored Where'd You Get Those? Like, yep. you know, he's a, uh, they're a good friend. And, you know, he really brought that energy, right? Like, you know, the, the different uptowns that he used to like rock back in the day. Um, that was important. You know, so like, you know, whether it was Jason Kidd's or Barry Sanders, Bo Jackson's, you know, Dion's, like, those were all, you know, sort of reference points. Mm -hmm. So they had to wear those. And uh, in like 95, ni around 95, 96, I had an opportunity where like I was escorting Little Kim around mm -hmm. to radio stations. And a guy from Reebok approached me and said like, you know, I want to put some shoes on Kim. And we got to talking, you know, like this. Yeah. And he said, hey, how would you like to, um, you know, work some kicks for us, just like how you do the music? Hmm. Okay, let's talk, yeah. you know. It, 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 now you're gonna have to give me like ability to write orders mm -hmm. and uh, promo out different things to people. And like, you know, I wanna put the brand like uh, to sort of surround the artists. So like, I don't only wanna influence the the person, the personality, but like those around them so that they can't help but to think about your brand all the time. Yeah. So that's back when like Nike was dominating, yeah. right? But Reebok was trying to make their way in mm -hmm. and they had just signed this kid out of Georgetown, <laughs> whom, you know, Alan I knew Iverson. very well, yeah. Alan <laughs> Iverson. And AI really represented the streets. Mm -hmm. So that really kind of worked. So, you know, one of my initial gigs was like, you know, outfitting people with questions. <laughs> you know, the blue suede toes. Yeah. I mean, that was an easy job, but like, I, you know, I really got like a chance to promo out different sizes, mm -hmm. you know, socks, t-shirts, hats, headbands, you know, whatever. And, you know, I started making promo items like, you know, police tapes. <laughs> You know, things yeah. that will just create attention, like, yeah. you know, your gigantic stickers. Wow. You know, so I brought, like, some of that, you know, street magic from doing records to sneaker industry. Hmm. And we're able to create a pretty good, you know, we made up a lot of room between Nike and Reebok at that time. Like, hmm. in 96, 97, I think Reebok was very relevant. Yeah, extremely relevant. Yeah, so I did that um, in the beginning, again, I was getting paid in product, mm. you know, to outfit like all my street team guys mm -hmm. and stuff. And then like once I got my first, you know, project well executed and I was able to like get a little shed at BET to outfit everybody that was coming through town, yeah. they started paying me, <laughs> you know. So that's how I got in with the sneaker business. and. I, you know, I was uh, fortunate enough to like befriend some people because I just wanted to have access to sneakers. Yeah, you like I just want access to to the stock. Yeah, because right? you genuinely wanted 
fresh stuff, but yep. then you start to realize like, hey, like there's maybe a business side to this. So the day that I realized there's a business side to this was uh, I was accompanying my friend Mike Parker, who mm. I've been like hounding to get free shoes from. <laughs> And Mike approached me at a Gavin conference, which is a big, you know, recording conference, mm -hmm. and said, like, you know, what are you doing? I said, we're going to a radio station. We, we got Redman, we got Nas, like, mm -hmm. we're going to a radio station. We're doing all these freestyles and, like, you know, having a powwow on, the, you know, their you know, primetime program. Yeah. So he tagged along with us, and he said, like, hey, I want to show these guys some shoes because, like, we're working on this thing called Vault. And that was back when Drew Greer and mm -hmm. Mike were the only two guys on that project, yeah. right? And, you know, they were doing that with uh, uh, Sam Siegel and <laughs> Jerry Laco. So yeah, I didn't know those guys at the time, but I knew, you know, I heard of Drew and I knew Mike because Mike used to be a uh, PL, no, he was like an Eakin in my territory. Hmm. So, yeah, Nike. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I took Mike up there and Mike started, you know, pulling out his duffel bag. Yeah. And the air personality who was on the air, Franny, he's in Vegas now, Fran Della Bay, mm -hmm. he was blown away. And they talked on, on air for like over an hour. About sneakers. About sneakers. Huh. And, you know, San Francisco casts are like really into the sneaker culture. Yeah, totally. And people are like asking, you know, are they ever going to bring back the Neon 95s? <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. So just kind of like the light bulb went off. Like maybe this whole like retro thing that, you, and we didn't even call it retro, call like it the that. bring backs yep. that you all are doing. Yeah. That, that may be something for Nike, because like, you know, mm -hmm. five, six years prior to that, when I visited Nike for the first time, they weren't trying to hear that. Mm -hmm. They're like, we're yeah, a performance company. Performance, yep. So um, I had that in, in the back of my mind, and I worked, you know, Reebok, and, you know, I started making some money, so I was, you know, buying up more shoes. I was buying, like, one to rock and one to stock. Yep, absolutely. You know, the typical sneakerhead <laughs> move. But, like, you know, I had to go elsewhere. Like, yeah, other than Air Force Ones, D.C. wasn't really a good place to get sneakers because, like, we didn't have access. Yeah. So I'm in San Francisco, you know, I'm at First Step, SF, you know, buying old sneakers. You know, I'm going to, like, you know, Walters mm -hmm. in Atlanta, like, you know, yeah, going Walters. to the back yeah. of the stores. <laughs> You know, and then like you know, my friend Ems, who's in New York, like, you know, he's like raiding old Jewmans and, you know, places like that for sneakers. Oh. And then like I'm going to training camp, you know, yeah. buying shoes from Udi and Udi had like boxes and boxes of sneakers everywhere. right? So I'm getting indoctrinated into that culture mm -hmm. and like finding out who's important. Yeah, you're starting to learn who's making the moves, who... And who I got to talk to. Who you got to talk to, who the gatekeepers. Yep. And then Mike Parker introduced me to my local sales rep mm -hmm. in D.C., in D.C., Baltimore. And this gentleman, uh, Jeff Tapkus, was like the king of mm -hmm. Air Force Ones because he opened those, you know, doors those for doors. Rudos, so Charlie Rudo yeah. and DTLR and all that. Yeah. And they used to have a sample sale. <laughs> At, you know, good old days, right? Good old days. So they had, used to have sample sales, and I used to go up to the, uh, where, the, you know, to their regional office in Columbia to get, buy samples mm. from the sales reps. And I'm nine, nine and a half. Like, I can squeeze myself into. Yeah, so you're into, a sample size. You're the perfect size. You yeah. You the sock liner out, you're all right. <laughs> exactly. And I had, like, arsenal of fresh sneakers, because, you know, you're seven months ahead of time, right? Yeah. I had all kinds of sneakers to wear to my conventions and to like artist appearances, whatever. Like I had to be better dressed than all my artists, <laughs> right? So people started asking me questions. Like DJs started asking me like, oh, how can I get those? Like, mm. What's up with those? So I became like sort of a go-to guy for that. Right. And that made me realize like, you know, maybe something that I can do, right? Mm -hmm. And then, in like early 2000s, right after I got married, Undefeated popped up. Mm. Out in LA? Out in LA. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm visiting LA and I think I was uh, working on a project for Avia mm. when they were trying to come back. Mm -hmm. So me and Diego from uh, Leaders, yeah. we were consultants on that project <laughs> along with Jelly Bryant, yeah. you know, Kobe's father. Yes. So we're working on these projects and like we're visiting stores, you know, meeting people, and those guys had like the, you know, gray market goods from like Europe. 
Mm -hmm. You know, so because you know Ed and James, like they used to send people to Japan and Europe to get like you know, the sneakers, right, right, and they right. would and bring them bring there. Back in. Yeah. So, wow, like you know these Michigan color dunks. Yeah. You kidding me? Like, like I, I don't have these in in DC. <laughs> I can't even get a sample. Yeah. You know, and I you know I bought some of those, and like I remember Chris from Union had like a cobbler do a Louis Vuitton Air Force One in like 2002. Mm -hmm. I brought those and like I came back to DC and showed it to my sales rep and was like, we can't get those. Huh. So there's like, you know, just interest. Interest. You know. Yeah. And then Nike Talk was big. Yeah. So nice. like my free time, I'm always on Nike Talk, like dropping gems, like, you know, sample pictures. Yeah, like I found these. Yeah. Yep. And like, you know, I had catalogs. Mm -hmm. So I was offering information to people. Uh -huh. So you know, something's there again. Yeah. And then like these local kids are like, big bro, we gotta open up a sneaker store. Like, you know, mm -hmm. we're, we're, we're getting left out. Like we're just getting, you know, crapped on. Yeah. And then Huff opens in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And I go to Huff and they got SBs. Huh. I mean, it's a whole different world. A whole different world, yeah. SB was a whole nother era. Yeah, but that's the one that, you know, like, you know, one segment of the business that got that hype train going, yeah. right? And what I did with Huff is, at that time in 2002, I was consulting for New Era. Mm. And I, was, I came in to bring like a strategic out plan from being overly reliant on license business. Because mm. you know, they were paying MLB and NFL a lot of money, but what if like they increased the licensing fee and they're kind of out, right? Yeah. So they wanted like an alternative stream of income. Hmm. And my idea was to go sign up streetwear brands. Hmm. So, you know, Keith is a friend of mine. I shop at his stores, yeah. you know. And they, at the, my big client at the time, because I had already transitioned out of music business, mm -hmm. I was consulting for EA. Huh. So EA Sports. I'm there. <laughs> I'm there and I'm always taking athletes and like my street team and, you know, reps to Huff whenever we're in San Francisco because like we got to stop by there. Yeah, that's that's the homie. Stuff, yeah. And then, you know, my man Mike from True, same thing. Like we go to both stores and they have all these sneakers and they have lines for kids like coming in to buy like SBs. Come on. So I'm like, I can do this. <laughs> I, I help these guys, yeah, like, you know, put their brand on the map. Like, you know, I, I put their brands on the hats and everything. Yeah. Like I already have the resources. Mm -hmm. And I know the sales rep. Yep. So you just gotta put it together. I just gotta come up with money. Yeah. You know, get a place, mm -hmm. find people who work, because I'm already making too much money doing, you know, agency work, right? <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm not going to be stuck at a store. <laughs> so this was like my retirement plan. Okay. So 2006, you know, my kids are like three and four years old. Mm -hmm. I really don't have any inclination to work at a sneaker store, but I wanted to own it. I wanted to have access. Yeah. I wanted to like, you know, build a brand. Yeah. And then you would do it. You, you already got the connections and relationships, so you could just promote and send people to my store, yeah. and it's just automatic. Like, yeah. you know, one hand watches the other, right? right? Absolutely. So th that was the plan, what and happens? what happens? <laughs> so I had like a couple of par potential partners. Mm -hmm. They were younger guys, and they said, you know, they'll come up with money. And, you know, we'll, I, don't, I don't have to put in any of my money because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm bringing the relationships, right? So first go around, a little late on the money. You know, we have to sign a lease. Nobody owns a property. I'm the only one that's a little bit older, so I own a property. Whew. So I have to co-sign for it. Whew. So I'm the guarantor. Yeah, you're the only one on the hook. Yep, I'm the guarantor on the rent. And you know the Nike contract. Yes. Nike's gonna get their money. They're gonna okay? get their money, regardless. So I, guess whose house is under guarantee ship? Wow. My. Yours. So we go through this. And these younger guys have, you know, other interests. And life comes up, hmm. you know, I can't do it, B, sorry. Or like, you know, I have other things to do. I have school, you know, my mother doesn't want to invest this money into this business. Oof. So I'm kind of stuck. 
Yeah, you, you know, have to move forward. I'm kind of stuck, but this is also the golden goose, right? So like, is is the cow that is the chicken that lays golden eggs? Like, yeah, so your your eyes, you you're not seeing it. You know, there's risk, but you're like, but it's I'm also an opportunity. Yeah. So I have a talk with my wife. She's not too happy about it, <laughs> but she she reluctantly agrees that we can do this because there's probably no one else that knows more more about this business than I, right? So mm -hmm. like, go ahead. Yeah. So I got the blessings hmm. of building this, you know, store. And I've, you know, I find one of my or the, or the street team guys to like run it because like, I don't want to be there and I can't be there. And you can't be there because you're in your agency business. Right. Yeah. So we open up the store. Mm -hmm. And it's a huge success. I mean, we have a line. Yeah. Everybody loves it. And, you know, we have, you know, my logo was done by a friend of mine who used to be creative director at True. <laughs> and he went on to become the creative director at Gap and North Face. Jeez. So, you know, it's a Philly cat. Yeah. And he gets it. So, like, you know, we get the major logo. We got the bar logo. We got all that, you know, stuff. We got the logo on New Era hats. Yeah. Like, nobody that was starting a new store, had new had, contract. Had, had those type of ac that access. Nobody that was starting a new store had a Jordan contract. Yeah. We had all that. Huh. You know, coming out in December of 2006, like, you know, we came out with Spiz Ikes. <laughs> you know, that was like green beans and Spiz Ikes were like first two shoes that we ever sold. Wow. And yeah. we had a line for it. Yeah, them. lines, yeah. You know, huh. so that was big. And then, like, you know, my hats are on, you know, DJ Clark Kent, yeah. David Banner, you know, the big boy. Like, yeah. everyone has it because, you know, I'm using, I'm leveraging my relationships. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, we're, we're good on the surface. On the surface. But we What's are, happening like, under the surface? Man, I'm not there. So, like, you know, things are just getting relegated all the time. Mm. You know, managers being late, <laughs> not showing up to work. <laughs> You know, I have 10 people on payroll and like half of them don't want to like take shifts. You know, a lot of it goes on. Yeah, so you're just eating, eating at your cost. And, and, and there's like this huge hole at the bottom, right? Mm. Which like, I'm, my agency business is doing better than ever, mm -hmm. but I'm not seeing any money because like this one business <laughs> makes the money, the other yeah. business takes the money. <laughs> you know. Yeah. And, so, so what's your, how's your wife feeling about all of that? Not feeling great, but yeah. honestly, like, I kind of kept her in the dark. Yeah, because you were like, she's, you already felt a little resistance there. You don't want to add to it unless add to the stress. you got to, like, you, you know, raise, you know, right. red flag and be like, yo, it's actually like. And, and she's at home with two little kids. Mm -hmm. You know, like she's got her hands full. Like we don't have like a big support network. Yeah. Like, you know, my parents are older. Yeah. At the time, like, you know, we're actually like taking the kids over to Virginia to like, you know, help my dad go to doctor's appointments and, you know, things like that. Cause he's retired and, you yeah. know, he was struggling with his health a little bit. So like, you know, we're just, you know, she's just doing all the domestic stuff. And I'm splitting time between like my agency work and then like whenever I have free time, I'm always at the store. Mm -hmm. But like I'm sensing some things are just going left. Hmm. So finally, you know, in 2010, like we had to let the uh, manager go. Wow. And my wife at the time, you know, our kids were like seven and six and they were in the school full time finally. Mm. So they created some free time. So we said, you know what? Let's jump in. Hmm. Let's let's just do it. Hmm. And I took like a little bit more of time away from my agency business. Mm -hmm. But they also like at the you know, it kind of worked out for me because like a lot of these corporate people were discovering that I hold all the leverage because of mm -hmm. my relationships. Yeah. And they wanted to own the relationships they themselves. The relationships. Yeah. So, uh, you know, it would, it, what, what would happen is like I'll introduce somebody, mm -hmm. and it'll be like a celebrity or an influencer, but I'll also introduce them to their managers because mm -hmm. the check has to be cut. Right. And then all of a sudden, they don't involve their actual artist or the influencer. They'll just go directly to the manager yeah. because the manager promises them X, Y, and Z. Yeah, yeah. 
And then, you know, next thing you know, like the manager has his boy or, you know, his girl that has an agency. Yep. And they're basically an agency that caters to those, like the star wrangling, hmm. rather than like actually planting the seed for influence. Yeah. So it's a whole different thing. It's, different it's thing. not organic at all. Mm -hmm. It became pay for play. Yeah. But because the stakes get much higher with pay for play with the guaranteed exposure, mm. they have to cut me out of the mix because like mm. that money that they're paying me, they have to pay their piper. Right, right. right. So now you're getting cut out of that. I'm getting cut out of that, and I was just kind of like relieved. Hmm. Now, honestly, because like you know, I didn't think that going to work every day at a sneaker store was would be any worse than like having to hold somebody's hand full time and explaining why <laughs> things are relevant yeah. or why things are cool yeah. or like what what the cultural relevance or cultural nuances are mm -hmm. because like that's as you know people like us when we work for big corporate entities a lot of times like they value us for that yeah and you're, that you're, only you're, you're translating things for yeah them. translating Otherwise, you know they're gonna do their own thing right regardless and it's for us because we grew up in that culture it's instinctual mm -hmm. but for them it's just like it's very mechanical yeah and, and you can't you can't fake you know something that's very natural right, right? something that's just second nature yeah. and, and you can always feel that um, Dougie one of the last things I wanted to ask you was um, since you've had such a, a varied career, um, there are a lot of young cats coming up, and we've been given a lot of good game in, in regards to some of the different ways of thinking and approaching things. And especially I like the way that you, you had spoke so much about that source um, moment and, and taking on that opportunity. What would your advice be for a young entrepreneur coming up? Um, what advice would you give them on this journey? Number one, and I always say this, and like, you know, some people just don't like hearing it, you are replaceable. Everybody's replaceable. Hmm. Tell me more. Because, I mean, we all have expiration dates. Hmm. What should we do with that? Leverage the best out of what you have. Absolutely. You know, I mean, it's kind of sad to think about the fact that like there's always an end mm. but there is always an end right so the best thing to do and i you know ai is a great example mm. he used to always say like i play this game like it's my last one you know i play as if this is my last game i'll ever play and you gotta give it your all you know, and as business people, things become so much about egos and opportunities and like just being able to out with somebody, yeah. you know, instead of like, what can you contribute to the culture or what can you give back? It's sort of all about like, how can I take advantage of everything I have? You know, and even some of the most successful people in our business and like, you know, throughout every industry, right? Some people are very good at showing by example and mentoring and, you know, doing things to further the movement. Hmm. And some people are just, they say it, hmm. but they don't really mean it. Hmm. It's, it's just like collecting, you know, comic books or collecting coins or collecting stamps. It's just like I accumulate so that next person doesn't have a chance to get it. Yeah. They don't actually really want it. They don't actually need it. Mm -hmm. And they definitely don't want it. Mm -hmm. But if it's a means to prevent somebody else from getting it, mm -hmm. that's their way of power. Yeah. You know, and, you know, honestly, our, our business is full of those kinds of people mm -hmm. and also like you know a lot of young guys they come in thinking like that's the way to do it mm. so instead of like you know being able to bring the best out of certain people it's almost like how to keep somebody from achieving their dreams right yeah and like you know and I, I've I'm not even like 
the best person when it comes to like people asking me questions or like asking me for advice. Because like sometimes they're not ready to take an advice. Mm-hmm. Sometimes they're not ready. Because they're you might not you're not gonna say what they want to hear. Right. Yeah. Right. They're they're not open to criticism, mm-hmm. or sometimes they just haven't experienced enough. Mm-hmm. You know, like like we just talked about that. Like you know. You do free work, you do the grind, you do like, you know, different things, you try out different things to see like what you're best at, right? Mm-hmm. And only by doing that, you really gonna become like good at something, mm. right? Yeah. But instead like, you know, you spend so much time with it that you think in your mind, you're good at something, <laughs> but it's just the force of habit rather than the truth. Yeah. You know, and that that happens a lot. Actually, like I learned a lot from being in the music industry because some of these cats just don't like to hear criticism Mm. at all. It's like, yo, I've been been spending days and nights, like I I don't go to sleep. (laughs) I I record, that's my passion. Maybe you should give it up because, you know, it's not, the end product is not good. Yeah. Um, So empathy is another one, like, Mm. you know, what, you know, that, that would be like my second key word of advice to anyone is like empathy. Like put yourself in the shoes of a customer. Hmm. Put yourself in the shoes of like a young mother who's got to buy three sets of sneakers for your little kids. Mm-hmm. You know, not everybody is built the same. Yeah. So just, you know, have some empathy towards people's different circumstances. And, you know, same thing with like treating retail workers, right? Like the person might be having a bad day, may have found out like, you know, their, their parents or their significant other has a terminal disease and they can't give you a smile and dance routine, hmm. you know, hmm. have to think about that. Yeah, man, I appreciate that perspective, Ducky, because a lot of times, you know, we aren't thinking about, you know, the other what's happening in someone else's world. Yeah. We're usually just coming in with more of this selfish mindset. So it is important to kind of remember like, hey, like you never know what's happening in someone's world. Um, Absolutely not. Know, so definitely have empathy. And then also on the other side of that um, is to also, um, you know, it, it be open to criticism and, you know, put in the work. Don't worry so much about being entitled to what you think you deserve. Yeah. Um, yeah. It'll come back around. Uh, Ducky, thank you so much for sitting with us and vibing with us and, and sharing your story.